welcome to Return to Regalia, an Underland Chronicles reread podcast. I'm Una. And I'm Nate. And today we're going to be covering the first three chapters of Gregor the Overlander. Yeah, I'm joined by my friend Nathan. Hello. Um, Do you want to talk about just like how you came into the series? Yeah, well, it was funny. I met someone named Una. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I came into the series because Una was like, I don't remember how it came up, but you were like, you have to listen to this. And we listened to the audiobooks of it in the car back and forth on our way to work, which was really cool. So I just kind of got introduced to it like little bits at a time and also with Una just occasionally like speaking along with entire paragraphs of that. (laughs) (laughs) The audiobooks are ingrained in my mind from listening to them over and over again as a kid. So I know exactly how the narrator says every line. So I can just like pull that out whenever. (laughs) Good party trick. Yeah, it is a good party (laughs) trick. But yeah, that was the first time you read the series. Yeah, I don't even, like, maybe I'd heard of it before then. Mm-hmm. I think I was intrigued by the name. I thought it was like an adult book. Yeah, no, I, the very first time I read this was my, like, fifth grade or fourth grade teacher read part of the book out loud to us in class. I don't know if we ever finished it as a class, but at one point my mom got the audiobooks from the library and then we just kept getting the audiobooks from the library nice um so i think we should just get into it let's go so starting with chapter one i do want to talk a bit about this opening chapter Mm -hmm. so gregor had pressed his forehead against the screen for so long he could feel a pattern of tiny checks above his eyebrows He ran his fingers over the bumps and resisted the impulse to let out a primal caveman scream. It was building up in his chest, that long guttural howl reserved for real emergencies, Mm -hmm. like when you ran into a saber-toothed tiger without your club, or your fire went out during the Ice Age. I never realized this until I started this, like, taking notes for this deep dive. I really love the purposefulness of the descriptions of the real emergencies Mm -hmm. here because first of all the primal caveman scream is relevant because gregor is about to become a caveman literally (laughs) (laughs) like he is about to go underground and be in caves for a while and the emergencies the narration lists here are when you run into a saber-toothed tiger which is very much like the rats Mm -hmm. um, and your fire going out. That's like a whole theme. Yeah. In the book. That's crucial. Is like light is life. And if your light goes out, you're dead. And I think this is like so apt that it starts with him kind of contrasting the boredom of his summer with these made up emergencies of a caveman. Mm -hmm. But then his summer boredom is about to be interrupted by these exact problems. And he's not going to like those either. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I remember, I think when I first heard this, I was like, I was like, if I was a kid and I picked this up, I would be like, oh, this is going to be fucking boring and put it down. (laughs) Just like, I don't know. I guess she's writing the character's boredom really well. Cause I'm listening to this. I'm like, yeah, that does suck. Mm -hmm. And if I was like 12, I might've been like, I can't deal with this. I need it to be exciting right off the bat. Yeah, no, it starts a little slow because we don't really get into the like inciting incident until the very end of the first chapter. Right. Basically, Gregor is home alone during the summer. He thinks about waking up his two-year-old sister Boots just to have something to do, but then he decides against (laughs) it, which is a responsible move on his part. He's a good brother. He's such a good brother. He's staring out the window and in the courtyard outside, he sees rats in the garbage and the narration says he never really got used to them which is great foreshadowing for what he's about to face but then he goes on to explain through narration the summer camp bus left this morning with his seven-year-old sister lizzie and all the other kids and gregor has to stay home and look after boots and their grandma who slips in and out of reality we learn that back before his dad disappeared, their dad would teach high school science so he could stay home and look after the kids during the summer and Gregor could go to camp because of that. 
but that is no longer the case since dad has mysteriously disappeared. Dun, dun, dun. This could really, if this came out like a couple years later, it could really be like a Breaking Bad type situation. <laughs> <laughs> Like the dad goes rogue. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, how do we know that? I guess no spoilers, but how do we know that Gregor's dad isn't like off, just like having his own Breaking Bad style thing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Spin off series. It is so high school science teacher. Of him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you can do spoilers. Um, oh, okay. I'm operating under the assumption that listeners have already read all of these. That makes sense. So Gregor is very aware of his family's situation. His mom asks him if she should make Lizzie stay home with him. And Gregor just says, like, no, that's okay. She should go. And he says, camp's for kids anyway. Mm -hmm. Which is so sad because he's 11 and it makes his mom sad. But I really like the idea of Gregor knowing that it would be selfish to make Lizzie stay home. Yeah. And just, like, being responsible enough to, like, let her go and stay home. And he's really had to step up since his dad disappeared. Yeah. You get such a good sense of that. Like this chapter just sets up all the problems that he's going to leave when he goes to the underland. But it's like he knows and has to deal with all this shit that's like too much for him. And yet he knows that he has to do it anyway. Yeah. And I really like how she writes that. Yeah. He's definitely still a kid, but he's also just like super aware of his family situation. And Like you just said, during this first chapter, we learn a lot about Gregor and his family. Basically, Gregor is really mature and responsible for his age. He's really selfless when it comes to taking care of his sisters, and he wants to make things easier for his mom. Um, And his mom feels sorry for the position that he's been put in. And but Gregor doesn't want her to worry, Mm -hmm. um, which is just like so sweet. And also we learn that Gregor doesn't really think of himself as a kid anymore, which is very sad, but it's only going to get worse. (laughs) So yeah, grandma uh, calls to Gregor from the other room and calls him Simon because grandma is having a bit of an episode. And she says that she's worried he forgot his lunch pail and talks about him plowing. And so through the narration, we learn that she grew up on a farm in Virginia. Farm in Virginia actually becomes relevant later in the series. I I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, We don't learn a whole lot about Grandma, which is sad, but we do learn that she grew up in Virginia and then moved to New York uh, with Grandpa. So yeah, the family now lives in New York City. The narration says, sometimes Gregor was secretly glad that she could return to that farm in her mind and a little envious. That's messed up, Gregor. That's very sad. It's really sad, right? Yeah. Just the fact that he is longing for the ability to pretend that he's not there. He's not even wishing he could just be on the farm in Virginia. Right. He's wishing that he could pretend that he was on a farm in Virginia. That's so true. Yeah. Which is really interesting and sad. But yeah, so Boots is there in Grandma's room and uh, Gregor lets her out of the crib. And she calls him Gego because uh, she can't pronounce the R's in his name yet (laughs) so gregor asks grandma if she wants a root beer and she asks uh what is it my birthday (laughs) and the narration just says how did you answer something like that which is yeah hilarious (laughs) gregor goes to the kitchen with boots and there's a knock on the door and it's mrs cormacy mrs cormacy yes one of the mvps of the series even though In this first book, she's just kind of the annoying neighbor. Gregor finds her kind of annoying, but doesn't ultimately mind her because she helps out. Um, But she does take the root beer from him, (laughs) assuming it's for her, uh, which is funny. Um, She asks when he's going to let her read his tarot and claims she has the gift. Um, And Gregor declines because he thinks that Mrs. Cormacy just wants to ask about his dad's disappearance. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do like this this bit because it brings up the motif about the gift of prophecy and whether it's real damn Um, yeah yeah this is another thing that i didn't really notice until doing a close reading of it just now but the tarot cards from mrs cormacy don't come up a lot but it does introduce this idea of like are 
people actually reading the future or predicting the future? Um, or are they just using it for their own gains? Right. Are they using it to manipulate people? Cough, cough, rip red. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> So Gregor escapes to the laundry room with boots, and he notes that all of their clothes are gray with age, and he only has a few t-shirts that still fit him. So this illustrates the family's poverty. This was such an important detail to me as a kid, just because, mm-hmm. I mean, I our family was not in the same place that Gregor's family is in, but it was, like, comforting to have a character kind of be in that situation and reflect at least a little bit of like, my life, instead of Mm -hmm. being, like, I don't know. Like, he does end up being the chosen one in some (laughs) respects, but he's not, like, a prince. Um, Right. It's not like, you're Harry Potter and you have a zillion wizard dollars. Right. Yeah. Like, when Harry Potter finds out that he's the chosen one, it also comes with, like, your parents left you all this money. Right. And you can do whatever you want. And, like, that has its own entertainment value as a kid Mm -hmm. like imagining like oh my god what if i had all that money right but there's also the flip side of like no gregor is just this regular boy and his family is kind of struggling which is nice so boots chases a tennis ball around the laundry room uh gregor notes that she has a dirty diaper and purple marker all over (laughs) her hands gregor tries to remember the last time he felt as happy as boots which is just devastating man this dude is just having like what do you call it like a dark night dark afternoon of the soul just like all the time yeah he does not know how sad he is and yet he does yeah basically he thinks back to a couple like good memories like how he played saxophone in his middle school band concert at carnegie hall and he likes to run track but he hasn't really felt happy since his dad disappeared exactly two years seven months and 13 days ago He's been counting. Mm -hmm. He notes that he's not counting on purpose. It just kind of happens. Yeah, it has been a while. Um, He says that Gregor's dad disappeared when he was eight and Boots hadn't even been born yet, which like, that's devastating for Gregor's mom in the middle of a pregnancy and having your husband disappear. Yeah. That sucks. And like two, two other kids just being left with two other kids and a baby on the way. That's unthinkable. That, yeah. Yeah. She just sets up all these details that she doesn't really explore. But I feel like as an adult, you understand them more than you do as a kid. Right. Like, I never thought about the implications of that as a kid. I just thought, like, oh, it's so mysterious that his dad disappeared. Right. But now as an an adult rereading it, it's like, that would change your entire life. Yeah. That's really scary to think about. So the family had called the police, but the cops acted, quote, almost bored that his dad had vanished. Um, The cops thought that he had just run off and abandoned his family, implying that it was because Gregor's dad was cheating on Gregor's mom. But Gregor adamantly denies this. He knows that his dad loved his mom and the kids. Gregor debates with himself about whether his dad is dead or not, which is kind of like grim you know yeah he doesn't know why his dad would leave them without a word but he has a feeling he's coming back um gregor mutters to himself in the laundry room that his dad better have a really good explanation (laughs) for where he's been like he got an amnesia inducing head injury or got abducted by aliens and i do want to point out that he kind of (laughs) did get abducted by aliens if we are counting giant rats that live underground as aliens I feel like, yeah, I feel like those could count as aliens. Yeah, like he did get abducted. And when we find Gregor's dad at the end of this book, he does kind of have amnesia. He's not completely clear headed. So that's an interesting bit of foreshadowing or kind of just a nod to maybe what's Gre- going on. Gregor has the gift of prophecy. <laughs> He's just like, I bet you could make that argument. Ooh, okay. That's a theory we can okay, follow. Okay, let's hold that thread. Yeah. Gregor tells people that his parents are divorced and his dad lives in California and most people believe the lie more easily than the truth. Gregor starts thinking about what he'll do when his dad gets home and then he has to stop himself because he has a rule against thinking about things that'll happen after his dad returns. 
And this keeps Gregor from thinking about the future at all, since he's convinced that his dad could show up at any moment. So he's afraid that if he thinks about having his dad back, he'll jinx it, and it won't happen. The narration says, As happy as some daydream would make him, it only made returning to reality more painful. Gregor is acknowledging that his system isn't great, but it does get him through the day. Yeah. Which is super rough that he has created this like coping mechanism for himself. Right. And on some level, he knows that it's not healthy, but it's also like all he has. Yeah, he just to get through the day every day. Yeah, it's devastating. <laughs> yeah. That's another thing that I just didn't understand reading this as a kid. I didn't take a step back and think about what that meant for Gregor's like psyche. Yeah. Like, his, his state of mind is really in turmoil. Like he's always on edge, like... I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but like hyper vigilant. like he's always expecting his dad back. He can never think of having a future, so he's always kind of unstable in the present. Yeah. It's not, it's sad. Yeah, he's just living day to day and not thinking about the future at all, which is a really rough way to live at 11 years old yeah. or at any age. Yeah. Once you're 12, you can handle it. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Once you get into seventh grade, it's like that's oh, where yeah. the real shit begins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Gregor hears Boots giggling behind a dryer. The two of them find an old air duct covered by a loose metal grate in the wall. So it's dark inside, but there's some kind of strange mist that's drifting out. And the Boots... My old theory. The fumes in the shaft are just like hallucinogenics and they hallucinate their entire adventure yes. in the Underland. It's a story about the dangers of drugs, actually. Oh I remember back in the day of like when I was 13 in the Gregor fandom, mm -hmm. someone had done one of those like edgy, edgy theories oh, uh -huh. about like, what if Gregor and Boots just like died on the fall down and everything afterwards is like their afterlife uh -huh. or like they're in comas at the bottom oh. of the shaft oh, and this fun. is their hallucination <laughs> yeah yeah i feel like it would lend itself well if it was like adults liked it there'll be some dark and edgy gregor stuff yeah yeah <laughs> although teenagers can be more edgy than that's true adults i'm just trying to think like who like i think of the alice in wonderland thing like who's making all those like edits where she's like on acid or something literally <laughs> That's so interesting that you bring up Alice in Wonderland Ooh, okay. because Suzanne Collins actually wrote Gregor the Overlander thinking about Alice in Wonderland. Oh, that's that's she, fucking wild. Yeah, she was thinking she had like been reading Alice in Wonderland, I think, and she was thinking it's so much more likely that you would fall down a manhole mm -hmm. and find something in the sewers rather <laughs> than fall down a rabbit hole. So in some ways, this is like her retelling the Alice in Wonderland story, but like modernized for New York City. Right. Like, yeah, Alice in Wonderland, escape from New York. Mm -hmm. Boots holds out her arms curiously and falls into the air duct. Gregor lunges to try and catch her and he falls after her. And that's how the chapter ends. And this is basically the inciting incident of the entire series. Yeah. Like, nothing is the same after this. It's it's a great first chapter. It sets up so much. It really does. Like, like rereading it, I'm like, wow, they really get right to it. Like, mm -hmm. when I first heard it, I'm like, oh, man, it's summer, it's hot. But it's like, no, he's going right down that hole. Yeah. Yeah. We get a little bit about his family, and then it's right into the adventure. So yeah, chapter one sets up a lot of what's to come in the book and the rest of the series. It tells us about Gregor's values and fears, which is very important for a protagonist. I'm going to wait for Lola to stop scratching. <laughs> Intermission. Lola's the third podcaster. She can't read. Um, <laughs> but her opinion is still, we value her thoughts. Yeah, her opinion is too many rats. Yes, <laughs> too many rats, not enough eating. Yeah. So we learn that Gregor loves his family. His dad was smart and faithful. His mom is caring and hardworking. And it also kind of sets up Boots as this pillar of purity and a model of joy. Right. Which she continues to be throughout the series. We also learn that Gregor is very self-sacrificing when it comes to taking care of his family. And he's been through a lot and grown up quickly. 
And he's come up with a maybe not so great way to car- mm-hmm. compartmentalize and cope. So we also learn that Gregor has learned a lot of hard lessons from his childhood. He's learned that he can't always trust authority figures like the police who disregard his family's crisis. And he also knows that lies are sometimes easier to deal with than the truth. Ain't that the truth. So it leaves us with these questions that will drive the rest of the book's plot, which are what happened to Gregor's father? Where does the mysterious air duct in the laundry room lead? And how will Gregor and Boots get back home? So it does everything that a good first chapter should do. Do you have any chapter one thoughts before we get into the next one? I mean, I I feel like I was just spewing them all over the place. I feel like I'm pretty good. (laughs) Great. So yeah, chapter two is Gregor falling. He's confused because the laundry room is in the basement, so... Theoretically, there shouldn't be anything beneath it. So he doesn't know where they're falling into. He can't see because there's this mist surrounding him. He tries to reach out a hand and find a handhold, but can find nothing. He calls out to Boots and hears her laughing. And Gregor is glad that she's not scared, but he is. Yeah, because that's a nightmare. It's nightmarish, right? Yeah. I, I love that Boots is just, she thinks it's a slide. Right. She's just like laughing and having the time of her life. It's like boots, you're not you're not touching the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's kind of a recurring motif about how boots can't she's not scared of things, but it's only because she can't she's like not old enough to understand to be scared of things. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get back into that later in the book. But yeah, it is nightmarish what they're doing. So Gregor is actually thinking about a recurring nightmare that he has where he wakes up before he hits the ground and he figures he must be dreaming. So he tries to count seconds. um, And then when he gets past a minute, he starts to get panicky again. It's all, it's like a worse nightmare, but it's also like that one scene in Spy Kids too. I was just (laughs) thinking that. It is. I believe fair. I feel like that scene also would be terrifying if it wasn't in Spy Kids too. Very true. So the mist starts to clear, and Gregor sees the walls of a circular shaft, and there's an updraft slowing their descent, like Spy Kids (laughs) 2. And he and Boots land on solid ground, unharmed, but it's completely dark, except for a faint light off to the side. So Boots is over there, and she exclaims happily about a big bug. (laughs) Gregor follows her and trips, landing on all fours in front of a gigantic cockroach. (laughs) Later, we learn that this is Temp, oh, yeah. um, another MVP of the series. Yes. But we don't learn that until much later. So right now, he's just the leader cockroach who's holding the torch. The narration describes the cockroach as four feet tall, sitting on its back legs. Boots is absolutely delighted, but Gregor is terrified. Gregor grabs Boots and tries to back away, saying... Okay, Mr. Roach, so we'll just be going. He's so sorry. Polite. Sorry we bugged you. I didn't, I didn't bother you. <laughs> Gregory gets down to the under one and immediately commits a microaggression against the bug. I love that he he like corrected himself right, right away. Right. He's just like, oh, I probably shouldn't say bugged you. I think that's so funny. He's so polite. Yeah, he really tries his best. Gregor's mom really raised him right. Yeah. Sal? No, wait, that's not her name. That's Percy Jackson's mom. Percy Jackson's mom mom is Sally. Grace. Grace. Okay. Gregor's. Because you blew my mind the other day when you said Gregor's dad never gets a name. He never gets a name. (laughs) Back in the day in the fandom, we had like a poll to just like give Gregor's family a last name and his dad a first name. And I think we decided that Campbell was going to be their last name and that Lee is gonna be Gregor's dad's name. Nice. But like we just made that up. <laughs> Actually looking back, I kind of dislike that we did that. Because uh-huh. now if everyone's using that, it's like you can't come up with your own. And I think that people should just come up with their own headcanons for what the last name is. Yeah. Well, I say his dad's first name is Walter. <laughs> 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 I actually have a theory that um 
Gregor is in part named after Grace because they both begin with G R. Mm-hmm. So I think that Gregor's dad's name starts with E L because Lizzie's name is Elizabeth. Oh, that's fun. So I'm wondering if Gregor's dad's name is like Elijah or something. Yeah. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah, that's my own <clears throat> my own personal theory. I like that. That's you got the. You like we're searching in the text for that one. Yeah. You're like drawing connections. But yeah, no, it is wild that they just don't have a last name. Right. <laughs> um, but we can make up whatever we want, yeah. which is kind of cool. Temp speaks up in a hissing voice and asks, smells what so good smells what? And Gregor is stunned and confused because this bug is talking to him. So Temp repeats his question and then clarifies, be small human be? And I do want to just take like a little moment here to talk about the way that the cockroaches talk. Yes. Um, They talk in this kind of Yoda-esque redundant syntax, which I'm absolutely obsessed with. And at some point I will make syntax trees Uh (laughs) to try and figure out if there is like a specific way that they're forming their sentences or if it's kind of just whatever Suzanne Collins thought would sound interesting. But me being the linguistics yes. minor that I am. I remember you breaking down all their, like, all the underland ways of speaking. I will eventually oh, good. get oh, around good. to making, like, syntax trees and about all of them going through the morphology of their names and whatnot. <laughs> I'm really excited for that. But I'll do that when it's more relevant to the mm-hmm. story. Because we do get into linguistics as a theme later. Like, language becomes very relevant to the plot at some point. That's why you like this book so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before I even knew I was into linguistics, I I loved the parts in this series that talk about how language is important. I'm going to probably do, like, a whole episode about that. Nice. Just because I'm obsessed. But we can move on for mm-hmm. now. So Gregor thinks that it's ridiculous that he's talking to a giant bug. But he tells himself to be cool and he takes a big sniff and realizes what the bug means, uh, right as Boots announces, I poop. And Temp is very impressed, and he asks to come closer. And that's when Gregor realizes that there are a dozen more cockroaches behind Temp. And they come into the light, and they're all admiring Boots, and she loves the attention. Temp addresses Gregor as Overlander and asks if Boots is a princess or a queen. This is the first time we hear the term overlander, which is very fun that it's coming from Temp. But Gregor laughs at at this, and it kind of offends the roaches, and Gregor tries to backtrack and explain he was only laughing because Boots can't be a princess or a queen because they're poor, and Boots is kind of messy. And then he tries to kind of change the subject, and he asks about the term overlander. So Temp notes that Gregor looks kind of like an underland human, but he doesn't smell like one. And before we can get into what that means, Temp suddenly says, rat bad, and asks his fellow roaches if they should leave the underlanders. We later learn that the roaches have their own language that uses clicks. Oh, yeah. So they're speaking English here. But English isn't their first language, so the fact that they're using English here is entirely for Gregor's benefit. It's so funny that they that they use English to say, like, hey, should we leave him to the rats? Right, right. But I wonder if this is their way of being polite? Right. Like, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't seem like they're being malicious. Like, they're not trying to scare him. Right. I think that in this series, sometimes when the animals talk in English instead of their own animal languages, it's just because this is a book and we need to know what the animals are saying, right. even if they're just talking amongst themselves. But here I think it could be that Temp just like doesn't want to exclude the humans, Aww. which is interesting to think about. So the roaches decide to take them to the other humans, and Gregor is relieved to hear that there are other humans down here. But not for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Gregor refuses a ride from Temp, but Boots accepts, and Gregor makes her hold his hand while he runs alongside them. They travel through a lot of tunnels, and Gregor tries to keep track of where they are, but he gets lost quickly. Eventually, he hears the roar of a crowd. They pass through a soft, feathery curtain into light, and there's a big gasp from the crowd. Later, we learn that this feathery curtain thing is actually bugs that are just like 
I don't know how they get them to stay in the doorway, but they're placed there by the humans so that when the pattern, the flight pattern of the bugs is interrupted, the bats know about it. Oh. So it's like an alarm system. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. We don't learn about that until later, I don't think. But yeah, that's the soft feathery curtain that he's talking about. (laughs) Gregor's eyes adjust to the light and he's standing on a mossy floor of a giant oval arena lit by torches. Nightmare, by the way. (laughs) Just walk out onto the crowded sports field. Oh my god. There are seats lining the edges of it, like a sports stadium, and there are a dozen giant bats of various colors circling overhead, the smallest of which has a 15-foot wingspan, which I didn't bother picturing Mm -hmm. correctly as a kid, Mm -hmm. but that's gigantic. Yeah, that's taller than a per- that's taller than like two people. That's taller than two people. And the roaches are only four feet tall when they're sitting on their back legs. Oh yeah, wait. So like that's like a child. But then the bats are like much larger. Yeah, I was kind of imagining like, oh, he's a little taller than Gregor. No, I just never put effort into imagining Mm -hmm. exactly accurately how the sizes of these creatures worked, but (laughs) the, the bats are very large. Yeah. Which makes sense, because at some points in this series, they're carrying, like, multiple creatures on their back. Right, it's just, like, everybody's chilling on this bat. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. those scenes. I love when they just, like, take naps on the bat's yeah. backs. A ball falls off the back of one of the bats, and Gregor realizes that they're playing some kind of game. And Boots, because she loves chasing balls, she mm-hmm. goes running after it. Gregor bolts after her, but a golden bat dives toward Boots, and Gregor realizes that there's a girl riding on the back of the bat. Mm -hmm. Um, Later we learn that this bat is Aurora, and we're about to learn that this girl is Luxa. So the bat does a loop, and the girl falls off its back, and she does a double (laughs) backflip in the air and lands right in front of Boots, and she holds out her hand and the ball falls right into it, which is the most badass entrance of any character in literature yeah (laughs) like this whole next part where luxa introduces herself is one of the most iconic scenes of all time to Mm -hmm, me mm -hmm. it's it's everything so gregor sees her catch the ball and he thinks that it's either a feat of remarkable timing or incredible luck and when he sees Luxa's arrogant expression, he knows there was no luck involved at all. <laughs> I love that. It's the best way to introduce her. Right. She's so impressive and arrogant, and she's very smart and talented and athletic. So it's kind of showing off how talented she is, mm-hmm. but at the same time, she's such a show-off. Right. Like, her next... her ne- I mean, you're gonna say what her next move is. Yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah, so obviously we're about to, to meet Luxa, and there isn't a whole lot else that I want to pick apart in this chapter, except that we meet Temp, even though we don't learn his name for a while. But he ends up being one of the most important characters in the entire series, even though he's never really a main character and he also doesn't go through any character development because he's already perfect because he's already (laughs) perfect he gets a little braver i Mm -hmm. feel like okay um, throughout the series but other than that he really is just like this solid constant throughout the series like he's the rock of yeah of the group yeah and we also kind of learn about how the cockroaches love boots which ends up being super yeah i love that that she's like a fate again. Yeah, I love that Boots's dirty diaper is basically what the entire plot hinges upon. Right, which I hated so much listening to because I'm like, I don't want to hear about it. It's gross, <laughs> it's yucky. <laughs> but. but like, if the cockroaches hadn't fallen in love with her smell, they might have left Gregor and Boots for dead in the tunnel. Right. Certainly later they wouldn't have agreed to go on the quest. Right. It's like, this, this is nobody in the underworld ever shit their pants before. <laughs> so, I, I want to imagine. <laughs> I want to imagine that Boots, like, truly is, like, special for some okay. reason. Like, okay. maybe it's her being an overlander and, like, 
whatever she's eating. Whatever she's eating in the Overland is, like, different than whatever they're getting in the Underland. I think they do. Like, at one point, they're, like, trying to... The Underlanders, like, trying to cover up their smells, and they're like, yeah, we do this so we don't smell. Yeah, so yeah. So maybe... That's, like, a whole thing, is, like, the way that the Overlanders smell becomes super relevant later. Right. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. So chapter three starts with a description of the girl... So her skin is so pale that Gregor can see all the veins in her body. He compares her to one of those science books that shows the circulatory system. Her hair is silvery blonde and it's woven in an intricate braid. And her hair is so long that she can tuck it into her belt at her waist, which is impressive. Yeah, especially because she's doing sports. Yeah. And she's also wearing a thin band of gold on her head. And Gregor, looking at it, has the bad feeling that it's a crown, (laughs) which he's right about. It's later confirmed. It also says that she's six inches shorter than him, which I never thought about. Uh Uh-huh. But I guess Gregor is, like, super tall. I'm wondering if the Underlanders are just, like, smaller because they're malnourished. Yeah, I mean, they're not getting, like, their vitamin D. You get rickets from that. Your bones aren't good. Yeah. I think that... If we really broke down the science, we would find out that it's impossible for humans to actually live underground Uh like this because uh they would just get so sick and not be able to function without Mm -hmm. the sun. But we can suspend disbelief in the the book. And then we also learn her most important feature. Her eyes are a dazzling shade of light purple. When I was a kid, I (laughs) thought that was the coolest Uh shit. uh I was like, I want purple eyes. (laughs) Because, like, Boots, my favorite color is purple. Oh, nice. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But actually, this is really interesting. I do want to take, like, a tangent Mm -hmm. and talk about Alexandria's Genesis. Have you heard of this? I was... Yes. I was literally... I was going to bring that up. I'm like, not the time. No, it is the time. (laughs) And we are going to talk about it. Um, So Alexandria's Genesis is a completely made-up genetic mutation. When I was like 13, I did see this described in a Tumblr post. And because I was 13, I totally believed it because mm-hmm. it sound, it sounds rad as hell. Mm-hmm. I wanted that so bad. I know, right? But this is what I found with just like some very cursory Googling. So people first started talking about Alexandria's Genesis on the internet in like 2005. Even though people claimed the first instance of this condition was recorded in the year 1330. That's, it's all made up. It's all made up. It dates back to 2005. Dang, you really did your research for yeah, that. Yeah, listen to okay, this. Okay. <laughs> Legend has it that a girl named Alexandria was born with blue eyes that changed to purple by the time she turned one year old. And there's this whole story about like how her parents take her to a priest and the priest tells them a story about a race of people with purple eyes thought to have come from Egypt after mysterious light flashes in the sky. And these people also had very pale skin. So as the story goes, Alexandria grew up to be very beautiful and she had four kids who were all girls who also had the mutation. And Alexandria never got sick, and she died at the age of 150. Damn. So supposedly this gene was discovered in 1968 and got named after her. But this is all totally fake. (laughs) There is no gene, there is no condition that does this. It's made up. But just for fun, here's the, the full list of characteristics that people with this mutation are supposed to have. Purple eyes. No facial or body hair, just the hair on their heads, eyebrows, eyelashes, etc. (laughs) How convenient. (laughs) Yeah. White skin that doesn't tan or burn. Women with this mutation are also said to never menstruate, although they can have kids. That's, I was like, oh, ideal. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) They don't get sick and they appear much younger than they actually are. And they typically live to be 130 to 170 years old. They have perfect vision and are never overweight. Some people with this mutation have digestive systems that don't produce waste. Obviously, what? Like, <laughs> obviously, this is complete bullshit. Like, this is like scaring. Me. This is so made up. Yeah, but like, this was basically an urban legend. 
this was going around the internet. I really, I thought it was just that one Tumblr post. Like, I saw one Tumblr post about it. I'm like, oh, that's it, but it's not? No, when I was Googling it, there were multiple articles debunking this. Oh, that's wild. That had to tell people, like, this isn't real, and if you are experiencing these weird... <laughs> Like symptoms, it's this <laughs> other thing, and you should get that checked out. It's not Alexandria's Genesis. Mad. So some people have pointed out that the Underlanders match this physical descri- description by being very pale with purple eyes. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm wondering if Suzanne Collins read about this online in the mid 2000s and was like, "That's cool. I'll put that in my book." That's so funny. I like that. Like she's just like. It links them to the real world a little bit. Like, oh, have you seen the Underlanders? You think they're this. You think they're a hoax. But. Right. <laughs> I So it's totally possible because this book came out in 2007. So it's totally possible that like she was reading online about this and was like, that's so cool. I'm going to put that in my book. That's, I support your theory. That's sick. Um, but there are no confirmed similarities in the canon beyond just the eyes and the skin. Well, maybe, maybe nobody pooped. <laughs> <laughs> They definitely have bathrooms, though, Um, because these books are very good about telling you when the characters are going to the bathroom. Right. Which is something you don't get in other books. Yeah. It's almost something I don't miss. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, back to Gregor. So Gregor looks at Luxa and dislikes her immediately. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that his mom would say that she's, quote, she's got real attitude. (laughs) And the narration says... She would shake her head, but Gregor could tell his mom approved of these girls. I really love this aside about his mom. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. That just tells me a lot about Gregor's mom. Maybe she's got real attitude. Right. (laughs) Maybe, maybe, Maybe she was once a girl with real attitude and she's like, oh, I can't wait to go have real attitude again. Yeah. Luxa and Gregor are sizing each other up. Until Boots knocks into Luxa and she staggers back and Boots asks for the ball. Mm-hmm. And this is the iconic scene. Yes. Luxa holds out the ball but keeps her fingers around it and says, it is yours if you can take it. And Boots just tries to like pry her fingers away, but it doesn't work. Luxa says, you will have to be stronger or smarter than I am. Mm-hmm. And Boots sees her purple eyes and pokes her right in the <laughs> eyes which makes Luxa drop the ball. And Gregor just says, I guess she's smarter. (laughs) (laughs) He probably doesn't say it like that, but that's how he's (laughs) thinking about it. Yeah. Luxa recovers and says, but not you, or you would not say such things to a queen. Which is actually a lie, because she's not queen yet. Oh, yeah. Like, she's just saying that. That's funny. I mean, she will be queen when she turns 16 or whatever. (laughs) But she's definitely not queen yet. She's like one of those kids who's like, you're disrespecting a future U.S. military soldier. (laughs) Luckily, I have never had an interaction with a kid like that. (laughs) So the two of them introduce themselves. Gregor says, that's Boots. Well, her name's not really Boots. It's Margaret. But we call her Boots because in the winter, she steals everybody's boots and runs around in them. And because of this musician my dad likes. So I'm pretty sure that this means that Boots is named after Boots Riley, a.k.a. the guy who wrote and directed Sorry to Bother You. I was wondering because I was trying to think, and that's the only musician I could think of. It's wild. I don't know. Are there other guys named Boots out there? I wouldn't be surprised, but I think Boots Riley is it. Like, that's uh-huh. that's the Boots. All right. He, he's the Boots. I guess he has, he's has. he been making music for a while. Yeah. Okay. He's been making music for a really long time, and... I just skimmed his Wikipedia page. He sounds, like, awesome, by the way. Yeah. Um, And I'm not going to read you his whole Wikipedia (laughs) page, but he's a musician and an activist. He was really active in the 90s, which would line up with the timeline if, like, Gregor's dad was listening to him in the 90s. Oh, that's cool. So he seems really cool, and you should check out his work. Mm -hmm. And you should also definitely watch Sorry to Bother (laughs) You if you haven't already. So, yeah. Luxa says her name. And uh, Gregor provides a helpful pronunciation guide. (laughs) Um, Just a quick side note. Luke's name literally means light. Mm -hmm. Luke's L-U-X is Latin for light. Nice. So she's like, is it like light for a girl's name or is just the A for fun? I think the A is probably just for fun. Okay. Because the word... Luke's would have its own gender in Latin, and I am blanking on what that is, but I don't think that you can 
just make it feminine by adding an A. Yeah, I think that makes that's, sense. that's just for the name. <laughs> Is that like a Lord situation? <laughs> yeah. I mean, kind of. <laughs> yeah. But Gregor explains that Boots likes Luke's eyes because purple is her favorite color. And Luxa says that she's never seen brown eyes on a human. She touches Boots's light brown skin and says it must need much light. So there are very few physical descriptors of Gregor and his family, but a lot of fans interpret them as being black. Mm -hmm. And their race is never confirmed in the series. And again, there are very few physical appearances described. Um, But people also point to other passages of the books to make the argument that Gregor is coded as black. For example, when Gregor talks about how disrespectful the police were to his family Mm -hmm. about their missing dad, or the fact that Boots is probably nicknamed after Boots Riley, a black musician and activist for racial justice. So I did just want to make a note of that. Anyway, Luxa is touching Boots' skin and it makes her giggle because she's ticklish. Gregor thinks for just a second that maybe she's not so bad after Mm -hmm. all. But then she stands up and tells Gregor they have to bathe because they smell. And we learn later that this is because the rats will smell them. But Luxa doesn't explain (laughs) that. So it just sounds really rude. Like she just says you smell, you need to bathe. And she doesn't explain why. And like, no one really explains it to Gregor, which gets him in trouble later. Oh, does it? I don't... Yeah, it's it's in these next couple chapters, but like, no one explains to him outright that the rats are evil and can smell like he's an (laughs) overlander. So he doesn't take them seriously when they say you have to stay here. Mm -hmm. It's just like a recurring thing that no one is ever telling Gregor the whole story. And... That's so true. He works with what info he gets, and he's doing his best. <laughs> Everybody's just like, obviously the rats are evil and gonna eat you. Like, who yeah. wouldn't know that? He's from New York. <laughs> yeah. So Luxa starts bargaining with the cockroaches, uh, whom she calls crawlers, which is the first instance of us hearing the alternate names that the Underlanders have for the animals. They haggle over the grain baskets in exchange for Gregor and Boots until Vicus steps in. Before we learn who he is, though, the chapter ends with Vicus asking Gregor if he's from New York City. Oh, right. And I love how he's like, I just imagine him saying it in this like most ancient and like ponderous, important voice. New York City. Exactly. (laughs) Because it must sound, it must be so foreign to them. Yeah. Yeah, love Vicus. Can't wait to talk more about him in the future. I'm still, I still imagine him as Lego Morgan Freeman, Freeman from the Lego Movie. <laughs> Just I don't know why. That's so funny. I think that's a valid interpretation. Thank you. Yeah, it's good because like I can't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I never paid attention to the physical descriptions of these characters when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm pretty sure that when I first read these, I completely missed the fact that you can literally see their veins through their skin Uh and that they have white hair. Because I remember when I was like 10 or 11 years old, I did think that Luxa had brown hair. Oh, uh uh-huh. Like, I just was not paying attention to the physical descriptions, I guess. So only later, when I started seeing fan art, when I was like in the fandom on Tumblr, I was like, they really do have veins all over their body because people draw the veins and it's really creepy. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't think about that at all as a kid. Like, it's very unnerving the way that they look. Yeah, I kind of tuned out the veins part. Yeah. But like, if you actually saw somebody and you could see all their veins through their skin, yeah, that would be weird. But that was the first three chapters of Gregor the Overlander. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Probably, but can I think of them? (laughs) Do you have any final thoughts? I just think they're a really great intro to the book. Yeah. Chapter two is a little slow, and it's interesting rereading it because there are implications set up there that like later have relevance, like with the cockroaches. Yeah, chapter one is like the perfect little intro to Gregor and his family. Little break for chapter two. And then you really get into it in chapter three. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, there are humans down here. Oh my God, they're riding around on giant bats and playing a ball game. And there's this (laughs) badass queen girl who is mean 
And also, they're like bargaining with bugs, and if they don't bargain well, Gregor and her sis- and his sister are gonna get turned over to the rats, which yeah. is. <laughs> Which is intense. I want to like, I want to imagine, because right, the the rats, like they, impri- I'm, I'm trying to remember, did the rats imprison Gregor's father? Yeah. So I want to imagine like AU where Gregor, the bugs don't find him and he gets like adopted by the rats. Like, do they imprison him or does he become like Rip Red's like little killer man because he has the, 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 the powers? Like, I I think they probably would imprison him okay. or just eat them. Okay. Because I don't think Rip Red is with the rats. Oh, right. He's the rogue. Yeah, he's like the lone ranger. Yeah. Really so hot for a rat. <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts I did not have at 10 years old. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's the intro. And that's all we're going to be covering on today's episode. Join us next week for the next few chapters. I don't know if we're going to do two or three chapters. I'll let you know on the Tumblr. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr at return to regalia, one word. You can also send us emails if you want. Oh, yeah. Return to regalia at gmail.com. Nice. This is official. Yeah. You can send us threatening letters if you can find where we live in real life. Like, <laughs> Don't encourage them. Oh, my bad. Please don't. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me, Nate. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's so great to be able to talk about these books in depth with you. No, I've, I I literally had a dream about writing a paper for English class last night, so I, I was vivid in this. Yes, we're all just missing English class. Until next time, fly you high. Fly you high. <laughs> mm-hmm.